pastor's heart and Dominic Steele and we're talking about how senior pastors can support and guide our kids pastors with Bruce Linton. Now just a note the General Synod of the Anglican Church of Australia is this week and it's a line in the sand moment for faithfulness to Jesus Christ in that denomination. I've invited the Anglican Archbishop of Sydney Kanishka Ruffle, the Chair of GAFCON Australia Richard Condy and GAFCON Australia board member Jennifer Hercott to join me on next week's edition of the Pastor's Heart to process with us the outcomes of that General Synod. They've agreed to do that and they'll be with us next week. Now, Bruce Linton, he's been involved in kids ministry for longer than I've been involved in ministry, 35 years in local children's ministry. Uh, and Bruce, we've got a stack of questions, mostly about advising senior ministers about how they relate to their kids ministers. Um, Bruce was the main speaker at the Sydney Missionary and Bible College uh, conference on children's ministry uh, last weekend. It's great to have you with us, uh, Bruce. Um, you've, you've been the last little while after 35 years in kids ministry, mm. um, the kids ministry leader at the Church Missionary Society, uh, New South Wales. That's right. And you were just telling me that um, uh, there's a grief process in your pastor's heart about moving from face-to-face, week-to-week kids ministry to the more organisational directing yeah, ministry. Yeah, there is. Uh, yeah, the, the thing that motivates me most is uh, seeing kids put their trust in Jesus or kids that already love Jesus just growing in that. And so just, yeah, that's been the passion for me for a long time. Mm-hmm. And so it's still there, but I guess at CMS the main responsibility is helping people who are in their 20s mm-hmm. uh, learn how to do it. Mm. So it's training, it's organising them to do it. Mm. So stepping away from the coalface. So, yeah. Now, how do senior pastors prioritise kids' ministry well? Uh, well, the, I think the reality is for most senior pastors, they won't do a lot of kids' ministry themselves, although they might, and if mm-hmm. they do, they, they want a pat on the back. That's a good thing to do. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it just means that when you appoint the person who's in charge of kids' ministry, it's one of your most important decisions. So it's a huge decision because you're giving them responsibility in a teaching role that you probably won't largely observe. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be a position of trust. Dominic, with everything, like in in all church resources, it's how you cut the pie. Mm -hmm. Like there's a certain amount of resource to go around yeah. and that's you know it starts at fine you know often financial that's a concern but we're talking spiritual maturity like you at your church you have a certain number of mature leaders and you know that where you ask them to serve is vital mm. um, well <laughs> you won't get to observe them in action at kids ministry and the temptation is to go I think we'd get away with someone not quite so mature running mm-hmm. it we probably what I would advise, don't make that decision. Mm. Invest heavily in kids and families and you will reap the benefits. Mm. Uh, you invest at a young age, someone good, someone that you trust mm. needs to be involved. But there'll be a cost to that. And the kid being happier, being happy mm. and satisfied and engaged is actually often the determiner about whether or not the family will stay at the church? Oh, I I think it's the first impression you get. Like, I I don't want to diminish the fact that the the couple will get in the car after their first visit to church and talk about the sermon. They will, Mm -hmm. and it will be a determining factor, but the noise in the back seat is louder than the front seat. And uh, and if they didn't enjoy it... If they they, don't want to go next week. It's very hard to get back. Mm. Uh, You know, you, you, you know, we can convince each other to give it a second try, as adults, but kids, if the first impression isn't good, you, you, you're struggling, mm. right? And you're saying, we as senior pastors, we don't have to do it, but we've got to take responsibility for it. Yeah, you've got to, and what does that responsibility look like? So first point is the appointment, but then how do you keep the energy, the involvement, the love going towards that leadership? How mm. do you include them and make the person who's in charge of kids ministry feel like they're a vital part of where the church is going. Well, let's do how to do a good appointment first. What have you noticed about um, mistakes that senior ministers have made in appointing kids ministry leaders? I guess I'm thinking paid appointments at this point. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, they go for someone who's young. Uh, Usually it's uh, someone who's nearly finished teacher training, if I can be Mm -hmm. that specific. (laughs) And they convince them to, you know, perhaps finish college a year early. And because they're good with kids and um, they're, you know, they they clearly want to spend time with kids. 
And so often young girls get asked, would you become the kids minister for two days a week? Uh, and because we know that you like kids. Now, they're very young. Um, it's, it's hard for them to team lead. Mm -hmm. They love their time with the children and they're getting better and better at their face to face with kids. But can I lead the team? Often it's a hard thing to do. Mm. That's the hard thing. Can I work closely with the senior, largely male ministry staff? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big step up for them too. And we often don't look, look after them in that space. Mm. It, it's not necessarily a bad appointment, but it's an appointment that's investing in the future. That's saying, okay, there's potential in this person. How am I going to get the most out of that potential? And frankly, too many times I've seen, look, I just need it done. I, I Really, it would be great if I don't get bothered by this person, if the kids' ministry just ticks away and no problems, right? Can I just get you to react to a statement that a kids' minister, a more reasonably large church made to me once, um, they said, well, kids' ministry, full-time kids' ministry, it's basically full-time recruiting and training. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I think it was an overstatement, but it was an interesting <coughs> statement. Yeah, I think, I, I think I know where they're coming from. I think it is an overstatement because it's, it's not just recruiting and training, but it is in that investment in the future. If you recruit and... She was recruiting and, tra and training leaders, was she? Yeah, and if you recruit and train well and, and you get... Because obviously uh, the youngest leaders can lead with the younger kids. Mm -hmm. If you train them well, you've got future... You've got mm. leaders that are in well placed to become Bible study leaders, full time pastors, youth mm. leaders, all sorts of stuff. Mm. Not that they ever have to leave kids' ministry. Mm. But if you recruit and train well, 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 you need to have someone who's capable of doing that. Mm. And we often put people in that place, and it's too big an ask. Uh, we, we just, oh, I don't know, they, they seem like they're keen with kids. They're good with the creche, and they're 16 years old. And, you know, and then, you know, they get too much responsibility or they're 18 or they're 19 years old and they're asked to coordinate teams and uh, to me we they need a lot of support in that space mm. um, how do i support them when i don't feel gifted in the space myself mm. so because your priority at that point is not to teach them how to be better with kids you don't need to take a crash course in child psychology what you need to do is invest them as you would in any other leader and help them grow in their Christian faith. Mm -hmm. It's their character. It's their growth in Christian character. The thing that's often missing most is their depth of theology. Mm -hmm. But you as the pastor, that's what you've got. Mm. Be willing to share that honestly and, be, and want to know. The thing, that, the, the thing that's hardest is if they're struggling, you need to let them know you want to know. Mm -hmm. And if the ministry has a problem you want to know whereas i think too often it's like really only come if they if, if you have to right. and that they feel the pressure to go it's all going well so you notice it in a very young kids minister how's the ministry going great you know dig a little deeper all sorts of problems all yeah. sorts of problems yeah um so i mean it sounds like you're, I'm, i was about to ask uh what are the unhelpful things that senior ministers have done in relating to their kids' ministers? And it sounds like your first thing is neglect. Um, yes, yeah, so neglect is, it is it, and also not including them in the bigger picture. So when you have big picture moments, what is our church's focus overall? What is our focus for the year? One of your first ports of call there is how does our kids' ministry relate to that? What is your vision statement? Mm -hmm. What is your particular focus this year? We're having a focus on mission. Oh, mm -hmm. great. Well, how is the kids team, how is that going to impact them? How, are, we, are we telling them or are we including them in the decision-making mm -hmm. processes? Uh, yeah. So what would you say is best practice then uh, in terms of face-to-face -face engagement of senior ministers with their kids' ministers? Well, uh, <laughs> Prioritising time, weekly meetings, mm -hmm. having a time. Uh, so make sure they're included in staff level as much as possible mm -hmm. and made to feel comfortable in that space uh, and so that their voices are important uh, and they're included. But having time themselves, now that can be awkward. Um, you know, in, you may need to share the pastoral care out with mm -hmm. people that are trusted. But, 
but yeah, prioritising time with these people. Now, I said unhelpful things a moment ago, and I, we mm. talked about neglect. What other, if you like, specific unhelpful things that senior ministers can do? <laughs> um, specific unhelpful things is just isolating them, I think, is the... And, and But I, I think the other thing, too, is just being critical. Mm -hmm. uh, so if something doesn't work well, and to be honest... What, That's going to happen. What's yeah. the most volatile space within a meeting structure? Well, it, it's kids. Mm -hmm. Like if you, like, like if something doesn't go well, but it's aimed at adults, people will make the best of it. But if there's a five-year-old involved, you're going to know all about it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be messier. Uh, and if you know, if there's a twelve-year-old involved, it's going to be louder and mm. messier. Mm. <laughs> so, so things don't go well. Uh, you, you. you don't need the criticism there. Mm. You you need to help them figure out, was there something we could have done differently? Mm -hmm. Is there something I could have done to help? Do you need more support? Um, mm -hmm. Usually the issues, if you've, you know, if you've appointed the right person, they, they need the resources around them. Mm. Just thinking about our culture here, I think we've had the pattern of mostly of taking on ministry trainees. Yep. Um, Part of their ministry trainee responsibility has included kids and youth ministry. Some of them seem to have particularly gravitated to that yeah. space. Yeah. And then as part of our investment in discipling that trainee, yeah. we then said, well, why don't you stay on and work for us as a kids ministry leader? Do you yep. know that? Yeah. So you've identified a certain giftedness and enthusiasm, but also you've identified something in their Christian character. Mm. So there's enough right things in place but it's at that point that you can't go, well, let's just hope for the best and show, mm. <laughs> put, it, put them in the hall. Yeah. And, um, but the investment started with them as people. And absolutely. And it's got to keep going with them as people. Yeah. So who will be the person that meets one-to-one -one with them through the week? Mm -hmm. and, and it might be an older person who you know has time to do two or three really important one-to-ones. Mm -hmm. The temptation is to say make it that, that, you know, give it that to my three best Bible study leaders mm -hmm. so they grow. Make one of them the youth, the kids leader. Mm. They're, they're the ones working with the people with the most potential and they've got a huge amount of potential because chances are they're young. Mm -hmm. So invest in them. Mm. Give them that trusted person, your offsider, whose time is precious and absolutely gold. Give them them. Mm. Give, give them the kids ministry. I'm feeling affirmed at the moment because I'm just thinking about my own kids <laughs> ministry and thinking, well, I meet with her operationally once a week and one of our older women on the staff meets with her in a discipling well, format once you know, a week. Yeah. I, I, it's pretty, I'm important to, pretty important to say we need to set that up. But that's, that's, that's exactly what you, we need to be doing because that's, that's an investment. That's what I'm talking about, cutting the pie. Mm -hmm. And it is precious, isn't it? Yeah. The, the spiritual maturity we've got to fall back on, the, the senior people that we can use well in, in looking after people's lives, mm -hmm. they're okay. incredibly valuable. Philosophy of what we're actually doing face to face with the kids. What do you want to say to senior pastors about that? Okay, that's, that's an interesting one. And you, you need to think about this one. What's your philosophy of ministry in general? Mm -hmm. And how does it tie in? But I, I think philosophy is, the philosophy is uh, well, when I began, um, I think my philosophy was go out and do evangelism. Mm -hmm. uh, the philosophy needs to meet to grow the kingdom by getting more kids in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I, I think we, over years, particularly uh, the church I was at, we, we wrestled with that and realised our focus needs to be on helping parents raise their children and so that they can join us in the task of growing the kingdom numerically. Mm -hmm. So the philosophy is uh, partnering with parents in the spiritual growth of their kids would be our number one aim. Okay, so let's just think of senior pastors for a moment and mm. thinking about parents. Um, mm. and, you're, and, and I think we would want to say, wouldn't we, that the parent is the, in, at least in principle, the primary disciple maker yeah. of their child. Yeah, absolutely. And there's lots we can do to support that, or there's lots we can do that actually undermines that. Okay, how do we support, how do we undermine? Uh, to support, you, you look at every aspect of your program and say, does this actually include the parents at some level? So are we informing them of what the program's doing? Mm -hmm. 
are they included? Um, are, are we upfront about what we're teaching the children? Are we inviting the parents to, to talk with their kids, pray with their kids about what they're learning? Mm -hmm. uh, and are we helping the parents in their ability as parents? Do we run parenting programs? Do we help them? Do we help them to be better at that task? Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we support it. How we undermine it is we um, basically do the opposite to that. We just tell them when they drop their kids off, when they pick them up, and that's it. There's no information coming. And um, we don't ever encourage the children to ask their parents a question. We never invite the parents into the program. We basically say, when, you, when you're with us, you have fun. When you're not with us, you have less fun. So basically, it's undermining parents, mm -hmm. saying all the fun happens with us. We need to bridge the gap. What about if the parent's not Christian mm -hmm. or really not showing up, not taking responsibility yeah. and, yeah. And, and, and they may not see a problem with that? Yeah. Um, now, that, and that's pretty common, right? That's, that's increasingly common with, with kids in our church. The big thing there is to keep holding to the principle and invite them in. The, the children need to see that you want the parents there. Even if they, you know, they're reluctant to come, we will never stop inviting them. We will never stop encouraging them. And if they're non-believers, we won't ask them to do something that they can't do. Mm -hmm. We won't send home weekly Bible studies, but we will send home uh, regular invites to be part of the program. We will invite, make sure that the parenting programs we run, at least some of the time, is, is relevant for them to come to. We want to invest in them. We want to be consistent in that message, saying, where possible, we want to support you in raising this family, but we work with the limitations. Hmm. Um, in terms of parenting seminars, parenting classes, how, how much should you do? Well, it's, it's sort of impossible to answer, but there should, it needs to be there. It's the same with marriage enrichment. It needs to be in your program. Does it exist? Um, you, you know, have you got an event coming up? Can I talk about when the next one is? Actually, we haven't got one planned. You've got a problem. There's a problem. Yeah. Like it, it doesn't matter if it's next year. And it doesn't matter if you can't get to all the topics within, you know, three or four years that you want to cover. But it's coming. Mm -hmm. And it creates that culture that we talk about it. We're not doing it only because we have to. We want to do it. And there's another one planned. Mm. An annual event is just a good, mm -hmm. you know. What topics do you want us to do with parents? Uh, oh, that's, a, that's a good question. Well, I, there's a bunch of things I want you to do. Um, so understanding your child, um, under, you know, so child development stuff, mm -hmm. that's useful. Uh, spiritual leadership of your children is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I find more and more that that's the hottest topic that parents go, I wasn't spiritually led as a child. And I don't know what to do. Yeah, so it wasn't modelled to me. So to say, just do what you just did, and they'll go, well, that's pretty easy because the answer to that is nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you actually begin to go, just simple steps, how do you spiritually lead your family? Like, assume nothing. How do you pray with a child? If I want to tell Bible stories, how do I do it? Uh, so Deuteronomy 6 wants to talk about, you know, sharing the faith with your children as you, when you sit down and when you walk along the road. Mm -hmm. That's a skill that's less and less natural. How do you actually sit down and read the Bible with your children? And, if, you know, I would say most dads saying, I have no idea and I'm not very good at it. Mm -hmm. So how do you upskill them in that? And then the next one is to how do you develop that attitude that says... How do you do it as you walk along the road? How do you do it um, moment by moment? And that's, that's much trickier. Uh, I, I, I remember a, a, a good friend um, who said, look, you know, when your child, and they always will notice a rainbow, it's just a moment. You know it's coming. What do you do? What's your inclination? Oh, it's the refraction of light through water when you pass it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is. You need to do your science lessons. But as you could day. talk about Genesis. But you could talk about Genesis, but you're not going to unless you've thought about it 
before the rainbow shows up. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just having moments in your pocket. And so how do you teach a, a parent how to do that? So spiritual leadership of your family is a huge one. I guess the other one that I would say is worth doing is talking about transitions. I mean, if you've been in kids' ministry long enough, you know, you know the movement from primary to high school is going to be a moment. Mm. It's just... If it's, a, if it's not a big thing for you, well, lucky you. But for most, it's going to be a moment. Mm. The, the mo movement into preschool, the movement out of preschool into school, the movement out of school... Into uni or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're predictable moments of stress, of challenge, of change. How do you manage that? They're worthwhile things to do. And how do you parents. plan not to move house that week? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, all of that stuff, yeah. 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 Um, how do you deal with parents not valuing kids and youth ministry? Um, how do you do it? Well, I think the only way that I would say that is to invite them into it. So, and that happens at two levels. Um, one, to just observe it. And so that's the best convincing thing. Well, I, let me take back one more step. The head pastor has a role to do that and preach it. Mm -hmm. Preach the value of children's ministry. Make sure Deuteronomy 6 appears somewhere in your preaching program and you'll do us all a world of favour. But um, how, do you, how else do you do it? Is just invite parents in at different points and observe it, see it in action. Have open days. Mm -hmm. So it, does a parent ever get to see what's happening in your Sunday school program? And there's all sorts of ways to do that. Like you can have an open day once a term, once every six months, once a year, whatever. But you can also have moments where you want a testimony. Well, pull a parent out of church for five minutes mm -hmm. and, uh, and interview them and get them to watch just five, ten minutes here and there. It, I, I found that is incredibly value mm -hmm. in enlightening people as to what what's actually on happening. Yeah. yeah, what's actually happening. And that does more good than anything else. Um, what about when something goes pear-shaped? What sort of things go pear-shaped that are going to blow oh. up in my face? And um, oh, yeah, do do? yeah, yeah, all sorts of things. Like every area of ministry, we don't want it to go pear-shaped, but to be honest, it's a matter of time until it, it will. Mm -hmm. It's going to in, in some fashion. What what do you do? This is this relates back to again um, supporting people in this role. If something goes pear-shaped. We've got to want to deal with it properly. We've got to take the right course of events and you've got to know how to take it up the chain. Mm -hmm. So is the children's leader out of their depth? They need to have a very, very clear understanding of if they feel that way, who do I go to immediately? I need to know where I'm going. If something goes pear-shaped, we need to deal with it thoroughly and properly. Who do I talk to? Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, if there's an issue that means... Give me an example of one that was handled well and badly by a senior minister. Oh, OK, wow, OK. <laughs> well, well and badly. It's, it's just us. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure, sure. sure. Well, when, you're just, when you don't... Simple things of kids getting hurt in a program. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if, the, if the leader doesn't know uh, where the chain of command goes... So, so where I've seen it happen poorly is uh, a child gets hurt on a kid's camp. The obvious person, to, to the next point of contact is the parent. Mm. I need to let you know. But this leader is actually young, immature, and is the one person they're not... They're very good with children, but terrified of talking to adults. Mm. Um, so they've been identified as gifted with nine and ten year olds but the reality is they're terrified of 35 year olds mm. so what do they do they invest in the injured child and so they try to make the injury in their eyes go away mm. Mm. so we'll patch it up mm. uh, we'll get someone in to deal with the child and anything to avoid having the conversation with the 35 year old so where it's done poorly is they do everything they can. They know someone who's a nurse. We'll get in, we'll look after the child. You're OK, mm. really, aren't you? We don't really need to have the conversation. Mm. They did need to have the conversation and they needed to have it straight away. Mm. And, but they didn't. Yeah. 
and now that conversation had to happen, but it happened way too late. Yeah. And the parents, understandably, have got their nose out of joint. Yeah, going, yeah. I can remember my wife being grumpy on that point. <laughs> you know, what, what, what happened there? Why didn't you? And it, it, it comes back to that leader was put in a place and they were just hoping for the best. Yeah. Their area of strength was covering up their area of weakness, which is what should have happened in that situation was they had a much clearer chain of command. There was a set of house parents on the camp that worked closely with that leader. That should have been there and they weren't there. And so there should have been an older couple somewhere on site mm. and that leader should have gone, oh, um, can you, could you come with me as I talk to the parents? Yeah, yeah. Certainly, dear, let's go, yeah. we're, we're away. You know, now, it's a really simple process, isn't it? But again, we didn't cut the pie the right way. We didn't put the house parents in place. And then how should I, as a senior pastor, relate to the kids leader who's actually done the wrong thing and there's a grumpy parent? You yeah, know? Yeah. yeah. How do I um, both encourage them and correct them? And yeah. That kind so, of thing? so I, Dominic, I think it's, you know, let's talk about it. Like, so you can either blast them mm -hmm. or you can sit there and go, we, you know, what could we mm. as a team have done better? We, we, we could have anticipated this a mm. little better. Um, the accident wasn't just unlucky. It was, it was a matter of time. You mm. take that many kids away on that many kids' camps. Then someone, it's going to happen to It's going to happen. Yeah. So, it's, um, so what's our system? We didn't have one. We need a better one in place. What's yeah. going to be the most helpful for you? You know. Yeah. Now, we've invited questions on Facebook. There's one here from Stephen Ermanston. Uh, kids' involvement in church on Sunday still seems to be tricky. We get kids in their programs, but, in, but what about the life of the church? How do we help kids feel connected to the full church? Well, I, uh, how we feel connected to the full church? I would say where you can have them in the Sunday meeting. Uh, to me, um, I, re I realise the, the comment back on that is you're messing up our meetings. Um, but I think that's what kids do. They mess, they mess things up. Um, that's when my life got messy, when my eldest was first born. <laughs> um, and I, you've got to celebrate the mess. Um, so I would say in, include them in the meetings uh, is when you can. Mm -hmm. uh, I realise that's not always possible and some of the COVID issues around here have made that complicated. But when you can, uh, celebrate the fact that you are a family, a church family of diverse age. Mm. Uh, and also in your programs, make the effort there. Uh, you know, I where you can include children. Now, that won't always be the case, but do events where uh, they're welcome in, have church picnics. Mm -hmm. now, I realise when you have a church weekend away, the hardest aspect is always looking after the children's program. It's always the most complicated mm -hmm. bit. Um, and the temptation is to not run one. Um, and how do you balance the, um, I mean, making sure the single person doesn't feel like you're always on about kids and yet you've got the hardest job of making sure the kids are looked after. How do you balance that tension? Yeah, it's communication up front um, and, and valuing them. I mean, to be honest, I think it works both ways is to let the single person know that they're welcome into that space. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, to me, it's a communication issue. What about when you have to stand down a kids leader, for whether they're a staff or a... Um, or a volunteer yeah. wisdom of getting that wrong yeah, um, and right. <laughs> I, I, I think the hardest, I think if you've got to stand them down, be clear as to why it's happening. So again, anticipate it before it happens. Have, a, have something in place, have talked about it at a staff level about what would institute, what, what would be the trigger that would say you have to stand someone down. Mm -hmm. So when it, when it reaches that point, make sure you do it. But it's how you talk about it and if it's possible, depending what the issue is that you've stood them down on, but most cases you want to present a scenario that says this is for a season, mm -hmm. this is for a purpose and we want you back. Mm -hmm. uh, the next complication, com complicating thing in standing down is how do you pastorally care well for the person you've stood down? Because the reality is you will have removed them from their primary Christian encouragement. Mm. They, uh, they will be looking at the Bible to regularly, 
with a small group, with a group of people related around that ministry. Mm -hmm. They'll be praying with them. They'll have been, their, their Christian life will have learned a little bit of dependency on the ministry and you'll have taken that away from them. And you'll, um, and so they'll be struggling at some aspect with their Christian life because you've stood them down, but you'll have complicated that by removing them from the ministry. You need to find out how you're going to keep loving that person. Mm. And that's hard because they've just become awkward. Yeah. They were in a much smoother situation. They were in a leader's Bible study or they were in uh, whatever system they were in, they had two or three points of Christian contact each week and you've just taken it off them. Yeah, yeah. And that's hard. Thanks so much for coming in. It's a pleasure, Dominic. My guest on The Pastor's Heart, Bruce Linton, and uh, he is the Director of Children's and Youth Ministry for the Church Missionary Society in New South Wales. And uh, we will look forward to your company next week on The Pastor's Heart.